Good evening, everybody, or good morning, or good afternoon, depending on the time zone. And welcome to this uh, Politics of the Pandemic panel for Historical Materialism Online. Uh, it is part of a series of panels today. We already had one on the politics of the pandemic in India, and there is one uh, following this session. And uh, this is part of the historical materialism online, which is taking place this last days and will continue tomorrow, instead of the usual annual conference in London. And I take this uh, opportunity to remind you, as Sebastian Bajan already did in the introductory video, of the need to support the historical materialism project by subscribing to the journal, especially taking account of the discount offer that is available, which will mean you receive a thousand pages of good Marxist theory every year. Get your institution to support the Historical Materialism book series by buying the books from the Brill editions for their libraries. And also do check out the really affordable titles of uh, the books in the Haymarket version of Historical Materialism book series. All books appear one year later, uh, much more affordable, and there is a 50% discount until the end of the conference. And uh, by the way, we also thank Haymarket because it is offering invaluable tech support uh, for, this, uh, it, for all these online events. And we have today a panel uh, with uh, Rob Wallace, uh, Richard Seymour, Jose Maria Antentens, and George uh, Nicolaidis, uh, who will talk on, on the central theme thematic of the, uh, of the politics of the pandemic. And we will start with Rob Wallace. Rob uh, is a researcher at the Agroecology and Rural Economics, Economics Research Co. Uh, his later book is Dead Epidemiologists on the origins of COVID-19, really pertinent, just out. I mean, it's been out for a couple, for some weeks. Also well-known author of Big Farms Make Big Flu, one of the most refer reference books on this uh, subject. And his talk title is Bats Come Home to Roost, COVID-19 and Dialectical Materialism. Rob, you have the floor for about 15 minutes. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. If you could put the first slide up um, and then we can get going. I have a lot of slides today. I probably am not going to uh, make my way all through them, but we'll do the best we can. So um, is the first slide up? Oh, OK. Um, I can't see them, so this will be a, something of a ride here. So let's do it. Um, jumping right in, um, if you go to the next slide, please, I think it should be a map of China there. Is that right? Um, so if it is, and I can't see them, so uh, we'll give it a go. Uh, there are different SARS-like coronaviruses mapped there in different host species across South and Central China uh, since SARS-1 emerged in 2002. And uh, um, what does that explain? Uh, uh, what explains this new push uh, uh, of SARS spillovers? Next slide. Uh, one thing is that the BRICS countries have decided to circumvent uh, the U.S. and EU exploitation and for better and for worse, exploit themselves. And so here we have uh, changes in land use in the Lake Tianchi watershed in Yunnan, uh, the Chinese province where SARS-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, very likely emerged from a species of horseshoe bat, uh, either directly into humans or first into uh, food animals that the humans tended. So if only as a marker of China overall, they are in the reds and pinks. Uh, development in agriculture, respectively, are impinging on the last of the forest where the bats roost. So SARS-1, MERS in the Middle East, and SARS-2. Three major nasty SARS in less than 20 years means we are on quite the pace. Next slide, please. Uh, this one, COVID-19, is now truly a global pandemic, hitting a country's global north and south, small areas urban and rural, although less so in Africa so far, in this likely still only the early months of the outbreak. Uh, the outbreak is speeding up at the global level, now clocking in at uh, hundreds of thousands of new infections a day. Next slide, please. Uh, in the US, with at least 10.7 million reported cases, perhaps as many as five to 10 times uh, that, 
Some rural counties are, are clocking in at incidences per 100,000 that rival New York City, or what began as the country's primary epicenter. Next slide. With the so-called rural phase uh, speeding up in May, but with another surge forward starting uh, in the rural counties this past month. So we see the worst time series of reported cases here post uh, May 3rd in purple, concentrated in the Midwest. It begs, how did rural uh, infections come about? Next slide. To start, like some countries, there's great variation in how states responded to the outbreak. So some uh, states were very much on board about putting stay-at-home orders right away. Others were uh, much later in that. Next slide. Why else the uh, variation in local dynamics? Uh, some of the largest meatpacking plants there on the red dots are serving as COVID uh, incubators across state meat type and company. Uh, the uh, Midwest Center for Investigative Reporting uh, reports as of November 13 that at least 42,000 reported cases were directly connected to meatpacking plants in at least four, 470 plants over 40 states. Next slide. Why meatpacking plants? Well, the start of the U.S. outbreak began in big cities and on the coast and was largely driven by air travel network. The rural outbreak, for lack of a better term, is likely networked by its vast food commodity trade. So we have two maps here uh, showing in 2012 the freight analysis framework area at the top and by individual county at the bottom, uh, the amount of tons being shipped uh, in, in food. Uh, so as this team concluded uh, or described, you can have a shipment of corn starting at a farm in Illinois traveling to a grain elevator in Iowa before heading to a feedlot in Kansas and then traveling in animal products uh, sold in grocery stores in Chicago. So however mechanized uh, the supply chain is, there are people interacting along the way. So food commodities are the means by which even the most isolated county can be linked into global epidemiologies. Next slide. And we can see the same uh, more specifically for outgoing uh, hog shipments and more directly related to the uh, uh, slaughterhouses that are that seem to be the focus. Next slide. What are the mechanisms within meatpacking plants? What makes them so in infectious? The workers, in effect, are treated as much as sides of beef as the animals that they're tasked to process. Next slide. There is a political ergonomics to meatpacking plants that uh, has long been pushed off the dangers of the plant and its throughput upon workers as just another externality. So worker safety and health uh, aren't necessarily a priority. And certainly Trump's use of the Defense Production Act to send workers back into these active hotspots uh, is clear as a bell on that point. Um, so as is the CDC and, and OSHA's um, entirely voluntary COVID uh, guidelines. But it isn't just the, um, it isn't just the, the White House fault. Uh, I'm not sure what you're showing here, but... Uh, um, okay, very good. Um, as is the, okay, but it isn't entirely the White House fault. County health officials uh, protecting companies have been documented to sh refuse to share with plant workers how many co-workers have become sick under the rationale of protecting privacy. Next slide. Uh, I mean, you should think about it. Uh, companies are clear that Plants, uh, plans are in motion to automate these plants. So it's something of an eco-modernist eco wet dream, uh, but they're clear about it in, in the course of doing so that they're going to uh, increase uh, the price of meat and when we automate the plants. Uh, so big meat is in essence uh, admitting that it's long depended on the cheapest uh, labor possible for some of the country's most dangerous work. As historians Walter Johnson and Monica Gasolfi describe, big ag's production and labor practices were rolled over from antebellum slavery and Jim Crow, with most meatpacking workers black, brown, and immigrant. So we have here, in essence, the next phase in racial capitalism. Next slide. COVID is also making its way to the front of the supply chain, starting these early days to infect large numbers of workers on uh, a few farms there in the green dots. Next slide. Ag isn't the only source. Uh, with the collapse of the town economy, many rural uh, communities depend on state and private prisons as a source of income. Here we have a map of U.S. prison populations and their weekly traffic inbound. We have large prison populations in cities, but clearly some rural counties rival their urban counterparts. And prisons were linked to six of the top 25 rural county COVID outbreaks as of the midsummer. So you have close living quarters, uh, kind of another trade in flesh, 
sickening uh, inmates transferred from county lines prison to prison, as well as prison guards like meat packers uh, from prison to community and back. Next slide. Comorbidities. Uh, other health dangers can make COVID uh, infections worse. So particular matter in the air is, is proven to be one of them. And I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, we'll just leave it at that. Um, next slide, please. We see most, uh, so what, where are patients to go? Uh, you can have a failure to uh, access emergency and critical care is also proving a COVID comorbidity. So we see many rural counties with hospitals uh, without ICU beds there in the orange or in gray with no hospitals at all. Next slide. And we can see all these factors interacting in real time. So in Loiza County in Iowa, which is south of Cedar Rapids, we have a COVID outbreak began in a Tyson plant killing two employees before spreading out to the rest of the county. Uh, so it made Louisa at that time uh, having the great, some 100 uh, infection per population uh, that was rivaling New York State. Uh, and Louisa County doesn't even have a hospital or even a doctor that lives within its borders. Uh, and state officials lied to the, as to the number of employees that were infected. So uh, very much uh, there's a class character to the biopolitical state at even uh, such a uh, scale as small as this. Next slide. So the uh, agribusiness system isn't just about uh, tons produced and the impact on land and climate. The system, uh, we can summarize, is in, embodied by a network of social lock-ins that positively reinforce each other. So we have feed the world narratives, compartmentalized thinking, export economics, etc. And uh, value accrues to a limited number of actors that are re reinforcing their economic and political power and thus their ability to influence the governance of food systems. Uh, so how do we get out, uh, how do we get out of this? Uh, can ag be a way out of the uh, COVID and, and many other crises? Next slide. Uh, one way proposed by the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, uh, they recommend here a series of interventions that unlock these vicious cycles out of industrial agricultural's favor. So for instance, one, develop new indicators for sustainable food systems. Two, shift public support toward diversified agroecological production systems, and on and on, intervening in each of, uh, part of this vicious cycle. Next slide. So we have peasant revolts. Uh, Global North and South are pushing back against agribusiness, and, uh, and on the left here, uh, they're eco-modernist allies. Uh, so starting at whatever farm stage, all these efforts, no tillage, cover crops, uh, all the way up through civil pasture and uh, forest farming, uh, they, they uh, uh, put together uh, up on this sustainability curve here, they're all aiming, next slide, uh, to introduce new virtuous cycles at the level of regional food production, building new relationships, mainstreaming agroecology, next slide. Uh, as measured by an entirely different set of criteria. So uh, instead of net calorie production or yield per hectare, uh, we can measure uh, nutrient content per hectare and nutrient availability for local communities and livestock resilience and social and health equity. Next slide. As uh, regenerative agriculture isn't just about healthy soils and carbon sequestration. So food is very much a social system. Presently, 98% of the land in the U.S. is owned by uh, white people, almost entirely a holdover of Settler Ag and the Homestead Act. And along a different axis, 97% of the poultry producers are contracted out by big meat. And so we have here instead uh, practitioners at Soul Fire Farm in New York State, and they embody a regenerative ag uh, that can, su can succeed only if it's linked to farmer autonomy, community socioeconomic resilience, circular economies, land trusts, integrated cooperative supply networks, food justice, reparations, and reversing deeply historical race, class, and gender trauma. So healing this me metabolic rift between ecology and economy, driving the damage at the heart of modern agriculture, including uh, uh, COVID, involves imprinting a different political philosophy upon the landscape. So we can move out from underneath the suburbanist export capital churning rural uh, counties into sacrifice zones and into regional food landscapes integrated urban to rural and tended by local communities. Next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, such systems can indeed be scaled up and scaled out. Yes, successful localism requires state intervention. 
As political uh, ecologist Jahi Chappelle has written, Belo Horizonte, a city of 2.5 million in Brazil, show that when outlying farmers have both a market and a pl price guaranteed in town uh, by the mun municipality, cutting out usurious middlemen, the farmers are more likely to engage in agroecological and organic practices back on the farm. They also are more likely to protect primary and secondary forests and plant a variety of crops conducive to the kinds of biodiversity that buffer wildlife species acting as reservoirs for our most virulent pathogens. So in short, a truly regenerative agriculture integrates healthy cycles of land and people together. Next slide. So uh, how about here in the US? Is it possible here? Uh, our Midwest Healthy Ag Project is in the midst of mapping a regenerative index by Midwest County based on this equation. Uh, in the numerator, do we have variables that mark regenerative practices? In the denominator, markers are of conventional production. And so the greater the resulting number, the more regenerative the county by this version of the index. Next slide. Some uh, areas are appear bending more in the regenerative direction than others by virtue of the combinations of uh, regional and local biogeologies, as well as um, deep political histories and ongoing political economies, all of which we are only beginning to unpack. And this is only a, uh, a relative measure. Uh, even in greener pastures mapped here, there is much room for new agriculture. Next slide. And it's beginning to happen in, in uh, just about real time. So uh, Reginaldo Haslet Marroquin of the Regenerative Agriculture Alliance just reported that his consortium just bought a regional abattoir to help spring regenerative poultry producers from one of the last holds large agribusiness has on their production the access to processing. And so during the COVID crisis, smallholders had, uh, were being placed on waiting lists of nearly a year at the largest uh, corporate processors. So along with expanding CSAs and such, Regenerative Ag appears on the march in response to the pandemic, as much as a matter of survival uh, as of principle. Next slide. But what if uh, Regenerative Ag has already been protective, uh, at least as measured at the, at the county level? So given the COVID-19 cases per population, what combination of variables mapped there at the bottom might explain their distribution? So geographer Luke Bergman and disease ecologist Luis Fernando Chavez are spearheading our modeling efforts on this front. Next slide. So we started with, started with a, a pot of variables. Uh, some of you will recognize uh, some of these from our index, but there's also uh, population by race, employment by sector, numbers of nurses and physicians, echo region, uh, Republican vote share, poverty, et cetera. Next slide. So we have a very complex system across a large geographic region, uh, likely defined as the correlation matrix here shows uh, by many weakly interacting variables. Next slide. So Bergman and Chavez ran uh, cycles of a thousand ordinary least squares linear regression models to estimate the best fitting general model. Uh, they also ran geographically weighted regressions to model spatially localized relationships. And the, the best general model captures many of the variables we've already discussed today. So our index enumerator uh, packed with all those regenerative ag variables is negatively related to COVID across the thousand plus Midwest counties. The denominator with all those markers of conventional production is positively associated with COVID. Um, but also uh, level, you know, we also have in here the level of uh, population uninsured, non-white population, slaughterhouses, life expectancy under Obama and employment in, in big ag. But we, and the, uh, up until now, we've only been talking about these qualitatively, uh, and now it's showing up in the more quantitative models. And I only have a couple minutes left, uh, and I just have a couple slides, um, but uh, next slide, please. Um, the thing is about a general model, it's that you're giving uh, grand conclusions over uh, um, uh, states, US states that are often the size of single countries. So our uh, geographically weighted model parses all these variables out across the counties. So in orange there, the variable is positively related with COVID cases. In blue, it's only negatively so. And in gray, there's no relationship. So the, the first thing uh, the, you, we see, the first variable there on the left is the numerator of our, our ag index with all those uh, regenerative uh, pr um, variables. Uh, we see it that it's, uh, for the most part, negatively associated with COVID, except in South Dakota. Uh, the next variable there shows uh, the population uninsured, 
uh, is positively uh, associated with COVID in the north in Michigan, but negatively across a, a swath of Kansas, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, why? Uh, that's the gateway to a finer uh, exploration. Uh, we just started these analyses a couple weeks ago. Next slide. So as we analyze the system, a kind of take home crossed my mind. How Here in something of the belly of the beast, as it were, I would like to invite people back uh, from whence they fled. Uh, Western historical, materialis uh, historical materialism abandoned dialectics, and fair enough, it's uh, a Stalinist uh, appropriation in favor of leaving uh, condi conditional synergies to human history alone. Uh, Terry Eagleton, whose work I love, and he makes a wonderful cameo in my, my next book, uh, kind of summarizes this cant, labeling dialectical materialism as both bourgeois positivism and mystical uh, vitalism. Um, but in practical terms, for us scientists, the, the dialectical is routinely embodied by the kinds of complex parameter spaces the Midwest COVID system we just explored is, exemplifies, in which variables, as, as seen here for gene by environment norms of reaction, can be parallel in effect in one part of the space and suddenly in opposition to each other in another with all sorts of second order manifestations. So the very space describing these relationships can itself be subjected to these punctuated shifts. Next slide. So there's these complex realities beyond human history that are repeatedly contingent uh, and COVID demonstrates this in spades. Uh, in short, there's a room for his, an historical empiricism that can get help us uh, the next topsy-turvy decade. Strategies taking us out from underneath COVID-19 and the pandemics likely to follow require some foundational shifts even for the system's uh, opposition. That, that's us, right? Uh, so the echo health facts on the ground do refute neoliberal capitalism, yes, but it also refutes its cousins, echo modernism, land sparing, and half-earth rewilding. So instead, you know, we should move toward things like land sharing, agrobiodiversity, food forests, like the one on the upper left there, dating back to BC, uh, processors uh, as plotted uh, uh, by Melbourne, uh, across Melbourne by the Open Food Network app on the lower left. And uh, all these things can uh, fold in a, a presently dwindling social and ecosystem services, including the livestock and crop diversities uh, that box out our deadlier pathogens. So any strategy moving forward should reconcile with uh, dialectical materialism that reintegrates humanity in the non-human ecosphere civilization never really left. Next slide. Thank you very much. Next slide. Uh, if you're interested in reading more, you can uh, get yourself a copy of uh, books uh, myself and colleagues have been writing, uh, including the latest Dead Epidemiologists. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Rob. And now I give the floor to Richard. Richard Seymour uh, is a member of the editorial collective of Salvage Magazine. Uh, his latest publication is The Twittering Machine, which appeared in 2019. And the title of his presentation will be Particle Politics Against the National State. Richard, you have the floor. Thanks very much. <clears throat> So I'm going to start with some very elementary uh, scene setting stuff. Um, uh, we, um, in terms of particle politics, we are obviously surrounded by, covered by, infected by, and in living symbiosis with trillions upon trillions of particles of data. But uh, viruses are um, just exactly that. They're not life, they're not cells, they're bits of chemical data, or as um, Sir Peter uh, Peter Medawar put it in his Philosophical Dictionary of Biology, a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein. This is what Lynn Margulis is talking about when she talks about the microcosmos. Uh, in, a in a symbiotic planet, she writes, we are in mute, incontrovertible partnership with these microbes. We are a symbiotically evolving, globally interconnected, technologically enhanced, microbially based system. So it turns out that when we talk about particle politics, and when we talk about particles per se, we are talking about life. Um, we're talking about, uh, in other words, biopolitics. And what I want to do here is briefly look at the ways in which biopolitics even capitalist biopolitics, in contrast to uh, the communist appropriation that Paniotis Soteris has been talking about, 
uh, is in tension with pandemic nationalism. Now, um, I'm going to make some pretty uh, basic statements here um, just to uh, give me some background from which to work. Our microbial repertoire includes obviously many particles that jump to humans as we hunted and then domesticated animals, meaning that we have adapted to those microbes and they to us a long time ago. Yet, of course, the number of non-adapted harmful particles is vastly greater than our existing repertoire. There are 5,000 species of mammal to one species of human, meaning the animal reservoir consisting of animals sufficiently like us to host particles that could infect us is huge. Any constellation of human forces which aids that zoonotic leap can be called virulent. And in the biosecurity idiom of uh, some virologists and epidemiologists, um, as far as I can see, um, some of the most influential, uh, these forces are generally described in themselves as politically uncontroversial facts. You know, global trade, high-speed transit. Occasionally, there's a worry about the excesses of consumerism or agribusiness. Um, David Quammen's very good book, uh, Spillover, despite some great insight into the role of farming and world trade in the making of pandemic, ultimately identifies the problem as humanity. I'll just give you a quick quote here. Ecological disturbance causes diseases to emerge, shake a tree and things fall out. Human caused ecological pressures and disruptions are bringing animal pathogens ever more into contact with human populations, while human technology and behavior are spreading those path pathogens ever more widely and quickly. And if the problem therefore is humanity and its relationship to particles, then biosecurity need not involve any abbreviation of capitalist freedoms particularly um, the freedom of capital to essentially operate as a global conveyance mechanism for particles um, that could be deadly to humans. What it amounts to instead is uh, to tracking pathogens on the frontiers while also surveilling and managing popular behavior, generally construed as irrational herd behavior. The biosecuritarian register of disease specialists draws overtly on counterterrorism rhetoric. Uh, Nathan Wolf um, talks about tracking viral chatter, much as counterinsurgency would track terrorist chatter. They treat it as an intelligence problem to be resolved by better surveillance, big data and geographic information systems. Now, that's clearly the direction in which most capitalist states intend to go. Hitherto, um, what exiguous biosecurity infrastructure existed has usually been linked to the Pentagon's DARPA agency rather than something like, I don't know, the World Health Organization or the United Nations or something. Most states will now have to invest in some sort of system like this, particularly if they are in, involved in uh, extensive agriculture. Uh, for example, the British government's pandemic management um, has been guided from the outset by a combination of behavioral psychology and big data. Its joint biosecurity center, to be led by the government's pick to head MI5, is modeled on the joint terrorism analysis center. The goal is defined, as Foucault once said, of biopolitics, a bandwidth of the acceptable. In other words, it's not just about uh, suppressing disease, indeed it's not about that at all, but it's about regulating the movement of both particles and humans in such a way as to minimize the damage. Um, and, you know, this is quite an authoritarian top-down approach, which ultimately amounts to managing people while encasing the imperatives of capital and markets in a protective securitarian sheath. So, where does pandemic nationalism fit into this? After all, uh, today's most aggressively nationalistic forces tend to be aroused by the prospect of annihilation. They've been thriving for years on imaginary crises and disasters, white genocide, FEMA concentration camps, death, uh, death lists, the Great Replacement, Chinese climate hoax, Satanist paedophiles, according to the latest one, Islamization, or of course, famously, the Jews who will not replace us. You could call this disaster nationalism. Well, problem is here's a real crisis, and it's one that clearly, if you think about it, indicated certain policies that one would expect authoritarian nationalists to potentially find quite useful, such as uh, the shutting down of borders, capital controls, limitations on air travel, and so on. The nationalist terms of art today are, after all, protection, security, and control. And yet, though there has been plague nationalism aplenty, it's been largely uh, 
rhetor rhetorical um, uh, or passive, um, and where it has been rhetorical, of course, it's been very dangerously so. Uh, so, for example, um, well, I'll come back to that, but certainly it's, it's clear that Trump and Bolsonaro, uh, for example, were not more eager to shut borders or limit air travel or the flow of goods than their opponents. Nor do they seem to have been energized, at least at first, by the, uh, the the advent of the plague. To the contrary, the nationalist right equivocated in the early days between denialism akin to their climate denialism, deflection, and then in some cases cautious acceptance of the need for temporary emergency measures. We saw this with Trump. We saw this with Matteo Salvini. Uh, we saw this uh, with, of course, uh, our own uh, sort of Brexit government in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, not so with Bolsonaro, he's an interesting case. Um, we saw this with Duterte, um, uh, who sort of prevaricated as well. Um, Narendra Modi too was uh, a latecomer, but when he got round to locking down, he locked down pretty uh, energetically. But in general, what I'm calling disaster nationalism has been focused not on taking advantage of this crisis to um, entrench their political control, to build up their uh, political capital, to secure and consolidate their relationship with the, their base, which, by the way, uh, includes millions and millions of quite uh, vulnerable elderly people, which may actually be one of the reasons that Trump lost. Um, uh, coextensively with that, rather, they've actually been trying to um, restore business as usual as quickly as possible. And coextensively with that, they've been working hard to install a friend-enemy distinction in the story, some sort of theodicy. Um, either the disease is all fake news, all hype, or it was the work of some bad people, the Chinese, who are going to be punished, or as in plagues past, it's a punishment for the weak and slovenly. Um, in India, the disaster tale is of Corona Jihad. Some of you have probably heard of Rom uh, the so-called Romeo Jihad, in which Muslims are blamed for seducing Indian girls and then inducting them into Islam. Well, the Corona Jihad is essentially blaming Muslims for spreading the disease. Trump and uh, Alessandro Mussolini have both blamed China, disseminating their version, their own contagion of cons conspiracism by essentially claiming that the virus was manufactured in a Chinese laboratory. Um, this is a, <laughs> turns out to be a wildly popular theory on the internet. In the Philippines, the dominant disaster tale is the pandemic conspiracy theory. I'm sure you've heard of this, the famous idea that Bill Gates is pushing a plague panic to get us all vaccinated uh, as some sort of plot to control the human population. Just a quick um, side note on this. Um, the historian Richard J. Evans um, is very useful on um, sort of plague conspiracy theories. And one of the points that he makes about uh, the modern era, uh, in contrast to um, medieval conspiracy theories about plagues and so on, uh, is that while the, the, the sort of medieval theories tended to be, if you like, horizontal, in other words, they blamed outsiders rather than elites, Modern conspiracy theories almost always tend to identify an elite somewhere in the story, um, even if the elites are said to be in league with the wretched of the earth in perversion of reactionary populism. So the 5G conspiracy theory, the pandemic conspiracy theory, the stuff about Chinese um, laboratories, all this stuff is um, uh, sort of, um, if you like, uh, a sort of mutation of democratic ideology uh, in an age when uh, democ democracy has been hollowed out. And this has been disruptive in biopolitical terms. For example, the G7 couldn't even agree a statement on the virus back in March because Washington insisted on calling it the Wuhan virus. Um, uh, and later the Chinese virus and uh, in Trump's uh, idiot savant phrase, uh, Kung Flu. Yet the most telling damage has been done to national coherence. You know, we've seen this with Trump standoffs with states imposing lockdown restrictions. Indeed, with his own coronavirus tax task force. Uh, we've seen this with Johnson uh, sort of engaging in uh, struggles with uh, various parts of the United Kingdom. We've seen it with Bolsonaro standoffs with local governors over the use of Chinese made vaccines. In this respect, they've not been so very different from governments of a more centre-left persuasion, for example. Take uh, the Maltese Labour government, whose initial response to the coronavirus was actually rather efficient um, and uh, kept the um, number of deaths down to among the lowest in Europe, and yet who 
immediately after that reopened so aggressively and to such disastrous effect in defiance of their medical profession and their own scientific advice. So this is not um, something that merely, you know, the nationalist forces are doing. But what I want to ask really is why are nationalists, uh, today's nationalists, so eager to get back to business as usual if as I'm suggesting, pandemic management would afford them matchless opportunities to entrench their authority, as indeed some nationalist governments have done to an extent in India, uh, although they were already pretty well entrenched, in Israel and in Hungary. Why were there so many, uh, contrary to that, um, tumbrel speeches and articles from, for example, Republicans in the United States suggesting that we might actually let the elderly die. Indeed, they would be very glad to die so that the young can benefit from capitalism. To an extent, I think it reflects the sociophobia of today's far right, rooted as it is in a very thin form of civic association. Um, brackets here, uh, we have to say that India is quite a different uh, case altogether and that the role of um, the Hindu Val movement in India's society uh, looks quite different to the sort of networked far right that we see in the United States, uh, in Brazil, in the United Kingdom, in parts of Europe. But this sociophobia entails or brings with it a crisis of authoritative knowledge um, from the collapse of trust in news media to, in fact, the replication crisis in the scientists, uh, in, in some of the sciences, so that increasingly today's atomized, digitally managed subjects are apt to form vigilante investigative groups to determine the real meaning of what they're finding around them from 9-11 truth to QAnon. There is thus intense distrust of appeals to the social, which are taken to indicate a form of totalitarian oppression, hence masks or muzzles, for example. Um, in part, one could also argue that uh, with FOCO, that uh, biopolitics is an intrinsically ex inclusionary form of domination. For it to be effective, it must somehow mitigate the virulence of poverty and of violent abstractions like race. Governments, for example, have been obliged to release prisoners and to release some detained migrants to avoid the worst. They've also been compelled to introduce forms of wage subsidy and job support that go quite counter to the let it rip ethos of much of today's far right. Even the hawkish uh, British Chancellor Rishi Sunak, um, who um, you know, essentially caused the second wave of the coronavirus in this country by uh, sort of encouraging people to gather in crowded pubs and restaurants, has uh, been forced to go along with some of these measures. I say mitigate, very important to, to say that there's no absolutely no effort whatsoever to undermine these um, uh, these forms of slow violence. Nonetheless, this fact alone has provoked a, a kind of panicked anti-communism on the part of the disaster nationalists. Particularly telling in this respect is uh, Bolsonaro's justification for opposing social distancing measures. When he was interviewed, he, sa he said, I'm sorry, some people will die. They will die. That's life. You don't stop a car factory just because of traffic deaths. Sorry, not sorry. This acknowledgement that business as usual involves the state in legislating for a certain bandwidth of acceptable death and harm arising from capitalist production is obviously quite helpful because it allows us to see that the social Darwinist passions of disaster nationalism and their ideological sociophobia, which I would say are coterminous with their catastrophilia, are extractions from distillations of the dominant capitalist culture. And that is among the reasons why the behavior of capitalist states not led by nationalists hasn't always been that much better. There's also a sort of dialectic between nationalist leaders and their active base. It's notable, for example, that Trump really uh, was uh, all over the place until the point at which armed militias began to organize anti-lockdown protests, since which there's been a dialectic of uh, radicalization on both sides. Um, but I also want to argue, finally, for the salience of death denial in this form of politics. Freud famously argued that unconsciously none of us believes in our mortality. Both Trump and Bolsonaro embody this kind of denial, um, you know, claiming that the virus was just a bit of flu, saying that they wouldn't be badly affected if they got ill. And even when they got ill, and even when they spread the virus in, in so doing, um, through their public events, this did not seem to hurt them in any significant way. Trump, uh, when he came out of the hospital, uh, reportedly wanted to engage in a stunt where he ripped off his shirt and displayed a Superman t-shirt underneath. 
Now, this is, uh, you know, Trump fans would uh, recognize this because uh, memes all over the Internet celebrate Trump as a, a sort of Superman, a Rocky, a Rambo figure. But this was his style of death denial, and it paid off because Trump's vote, if you look at it, increased above his 2016 shares in the counties where COVID deaths were highest. Now, there are all sorts of reasons for that, but uh, one thing we can say is that it certainly didn't do him any harm. We often hear of the apocalyptic energies of end times evangelicals, and obviously there's a great deal to that. Um, but what I'm saying here is that disaster nationalism to core uh, fears and courts and is enthralled by and is aroused against and desires and wills on some version of the end. Hence, it's a version to even a heavily nationalized authoritarian biopolitics. But we have to think about this finally in term in relation to climate denialism, because we've, you know, we've we've often seen uh, this logic wherein climate denialism mutates into open climate affirmation, and it's never far from the surface, as Naomi Klein has discussed. So we've already seen some quite dark indications of rightist enthusiasm for the invigorating and supposedly eugenic qualities of climate catastrophe. And what I'm suggesting here and what I'll conclude on is that it's only surely a matter of time before we get, begin to hear the same tributes to COVID and the pandemic. I'll leave it there. Many thanks, uh, Richard, for this presentation. And now we move to uh, the presentation by Josep Maria Antentes. His affiliation is the Center of Sociological Studies on Ordinary Life uh, and, uh, and Work at, at, the, at the Institute of Work Studies at the Department of Sociology of the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Uh, he has written a really interesting text in Dialectical Anthropology, Notes on Corona Crisis and Temporality. Temporality, sorry, and his, as far as I remember, his latest book is uh, *Espectros de Octubre*, uh, a really good, uh, perhaps the best book so far written that attempts a Marxist reading of the Catalan crisis. Uh, so, Zep, you have the floor. Zep, you have to unmute yourself. Is fine. Yes, so, you're fine now. Yeah. My idea was to talk a little bit on political strategy and the current coronavirus crisis. Mine is not really a systematic presentation, but I would like to highlight some questions that I think that they are relevant. I think probably the first is to think a little bit on the concept of crisis itself, which is sometimes a concept that we take for granted. But if we go back, for for example, to classic studies on 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 the concept of crisis by Kuselek, for example, I think it's interesting in the sense that if we go back to the original meaning of the term that comes to classic uh, uh, Greek, um, crisis comes from the, the word krino, which used to mean kind of separate, choose, judge, decide, and so on. So uh, concepts that more or less suggested the absence of time and a moment of truth and decision. And in this whole range of meanings that the war used to have, it was the medical Hippocratic meaning, the one that prevailed and referred to the, to the moment where an illness can go worse or an illness can go for a better uh, improvement. So the very original idea of crisis was crisis as a turning point with different possible, possible outcomes. I think this is an, an strategically more fertile meaning than the current conventional meaning that we have today when thinking about crisis, which is simply a moment where things go bad. I think this idea of crisis as turning point has m more uh, interesting political readings. Well, a second issue that I think it's interesting to, to think about is also, which is the link between crisis and normality, in the sense that crisis cannot merely be considered 
a kind of opposite pathological state to the normal, as in fact the crises are consequences of the pathological condition of normality itself. And well, there is the classic idea of Walter Benjamin in, in his uh, Arcade project when he says the concept of progress must be grounded in the idea of catastrophe or the things that are status quo are the catastrophe that sometime, uh, somehow are useful to, to, to understand this pathological uh, condition of normality and this particular link between crisis and normality. So from this point of view, and when it comes to political strategy, I think that we have to understand crises as also moments of strategic redefinition in which there are crises of previous strategy because you need to readapt to a changing terrain. And also you need to build a strategy of crisis, that is to set down a strategy for an exceptional moment. So uh, um, in other uh, interventions, uh, both Andreas Malm and Panagiotis Sotiris have called the need for a kind of new war communism or new disaster communism. So if we come from this, maybe we could talk about the kind of the need of a new disaster strategy that basically avoids, I think, two, two possible problems. That one is to dissolve the idea of crisis in a kind of state of permanent ex exceptionality in, in which then everything is crisis but also avoids the other problem, which is simply see the crisis as a kind of interval between two normalities. And then crisis is just a kind of parenthesis. I think that the first problem is a kind of catastrophic illusion, kind of permanent catastrophe. And the second one is a kind of elliptical illusion. Crisis go and you continue business as usual. So I think that a kind of in-between uh, um, reading of this is simply admit that emergency is already the structural condition in which we have to carry a political struggle. Then there is a third question that I think that, that is, is useful to recall is that if we can understand crisis as turning points, then I think that another crisis, uh, concept that is useful to think politically is the topological figure of bifurcation, which is a concept that comes from mathematics, was used by French mathematician Poincaré in, in 19th century, then in, ten, in 20th century was a critical concept of catastrophe theory in René Tom's work, or also in chemistry and physics by uh, Ilya Prigogine's work. In social science, there are many usages of bifurcation. For example, Ballastain used a lot um, um, to analyze the imbalancements of the world system. Also in political crisis uh, has been used a lot. But, I always like to, to refer to bifurcation uh, directly from the usage that used to do Daniel Ben Said in the sense of, of have a strategic reading, a reading of the concept of bifurcation that allows to emphasize crisis as open strategic moments of uncertain outcome. And if we understand bifurcation uh, like this, then crisis is basically a moment of truth, which is uh, a moment of truth, which is basically the, the original meaning that you can find also in Authors like Thucydides in his history of the Pel Peloponnesian War, where he used the term crisis to refer to the key battles of the war and also to describe the plaque that shook Athens in that time. I think that this idea of bifurcation as possible outcomes is, is interesting to understand crisis, always remembering, as Gramsci said, that uh, in a crisis, despite everything, the ruling class always plays an advantage and has more trained cadres to reorganize and to keep uh, managing uh, the system. Well, there is a fourth aspect that I would like to talk about, which is, you know, the, the particular experience of temporality and lifetime experience that crisis may create, and in particular, the coronavirus crisis. Because I think that what we are seeing is a kind of concatenation of several crises that overlap in a very chaotic way. We have health crisis, economic crisis, social crisis, social reproduction crisis, environmentalist crisis. It's a kind of chaotic overlapping that, that shows the imbalances of global capitalism. But in the same time that there is this chaotic overlapping of crisis with different temporalities, a crisis itself is a moment of temporal unification. It's a kind of moment of um, temporal simplification. And in fact, Lockdown itself has been a moment of very strong simplification of social temporality, but in a background of a very discordant and chaotic temporalities. 
and I think that we have experienced a kind of simplification of our uh, uh, everyday temporality, but that overlaps in a kind of decoupled and, and, and unstructured temporality that reveals the contradictions of global capitalism. Um, the French historian uh, Francois Hartog um, defines the temporality of global capitalism as presentism. So a kind of regime of historicity in which there is a kind of permanent extension of the present and no future and no past. Well, I think that coronavirus crisis somehow modifies, uh, at least temporarily, the nature of this presentism in the sense that our endless present has been invaded both by the past and by the future, has been invaded by the past because the lockdown and pandemics evoke situations that we associate with the great pandemics of the past. And also our present has been invaded by the future in which that the former and an existing future now appears suddenly as a kind of abyss or catastrophe to come. In the same time, I think that the lockdown has had a very particular uh, temporal specificity in the sense that on the one hand, it was a kind of halt of social relations, but in the other hand, it was a kind of acceleration of other social process. And it created a very uh, uh, um, subjective temporal experience of a slowdown of uh, your everyday temporal experience, but also in a background of uncertainty. And also it created a kind of contradictory space and time fusion of all the dimension of our life. And the fact that the home was on the one hand a home, on the other a place transformed for productive work and also transfer of a new child to school and so on, I think was a good way to highlight the irrationalities of our social and temporal organization and how these irrationalities of our social and temporal organization are very much crossed by class, gender and race uh, inequalities. Well, there is a fifth element that I would like to highlight, which is that, well, crises, as we know, are moments also of simplification of social relations, a kind of moment of clarification of reality. When big crises come, uh, come somehow reality is clearer to see. Well, there is very well known Marx uh, uh, sentence in, in, in The Capital where, where he says that if there was no difference between essence and appearance, there would be no need for science. Well, during crisis, it seems that appearance and essence are provisionally more unified. And in 2008 financial crisis, I think it was clear that it was the financial system and, and, and the banking system, the one that emerged as more visible and people could begin to understand how finance system works. I think now there, there's been a lot of new light on the role of social reproduction, care, and also the role of manual workers. And I think that this creates some particular strategic uh, uh, um, questions. One, I think that it highlights when it comes about the role of manual workers, in particular in sectors like transport, distribution, and so on, the strategic relevance of logistics as a terrain for trade union action. There is a wall story of debate on this, but I think clearly the idea that logistics is a very important terrain of a struggle and to identify the choke points of all logistic chains for trade union activity, it's one of the most important strategic challenge um, for today. The other question is, is, and I think that this re-evaluation re of healthcare systems and, uh, is very positive, and also new debates that have emerged, like the debates on basic income and so on, all this is very interesting. But I think there are still some challenges to improve and to push more to the left, this kind of new current, uh, new pandemic common sense that is emerging. The first, I think, is, is to try to go beyond the anti-financial uh, common sense of 2008 to try to develop a, a more strong critique of capitalist rationality and to try to put on the table the need for democratic economic planning and the strengthening of public control of the economy. And the second challenge, I think, is to try to put on the floor an issue that is totally absent of the current debate, and this is because of the historical defeat of labor movement, for sure, which is the need not just to improve healthcare systems, not, not just to improve and to keep um, public services or introduce new things like basic income and so on, but in particular the need of a massive paid labor time reduction, which I think is the cornerstone to any kind of changing society model. There is no full, full employment with massive 
reduction of paid labor time. There is no equal sharing between men and women of care work without paid labor time reduction. And there is no time to participate, politically speaking, with, without reducing paid labor time. I think it's one of the absence of this new pandemic co co uh, common sense is the, this the total unexistent debate on, on, on the need uh, to reduce working uh, uh, time, uh, paid working time. And more in general, I think that if it's about making links between several debates that we have on the floor uh, uh, today, I think that there is the need also to try to link the question of democratic biopolitics that was raised uh, by Panayotis Sotidis in the beginning of the crisis, to link this with the world feminist debate on social reproduction and care, and also to link both issues with the debate on agribusiness and food systems, which are debates that somehow are uh, slightly uh, separated and belong to uh, to realm of different academic or theoretical specialities. So I think it's important to try to, to mix all these debates that not always go together. Well, there is a sixth aspect that I, I would like to comment, which is that, okay, on the one hand, the lockdown was clearly kind of halt of, of social uh, dynamics. But on the other hand, as we know, we created a new acceleration of some previous trends underway. So I think that the virus itself was a kind of accelerated of tendencies. It was a kind of, of trends. It was a kind of wormhole where stages are skipped and in which the leap forwards that are made also modify the final result. And there's been a huge debate, of course, on the massive acceleration of the digitalization process of our society. And I think that it's a question that we should Zip, we can hear you. Yeah, I mean, we have a small technical problem. Uh, we hope that uh, Josep uh, will uh, come back in. These things happen with, uh, with Skype sometimes. Um, okay, just a reminder to people watching us on the live stream, please, uh, if you want any questions, please post them, uh, post them, sorry, uh, on the YouTube channel. We will relay them to the author. And uh, while waiting for Jose to come back in, because now we are not seeing him. Um, yeah, okay, that was a reminder. Also, uh, I have posted some links because some persons asked in the YouTube uh, channel. I posted links to Rob Wallace's book, to uh, Josep's article in Dialectical Anthropology, and to Richard's articles in Salvage. So that different people can look up on them. Okay. Uh, okay. I suggest we uh, we do this since I don't see. Uh, uh, I think we go to uh, George, who's online, and when uh, Jose returns, we will make sure that he has some extra time. We have time for for the Q and A section. So, George, for about 10, 11 minutes, you have the floor to comment on uh, what has been discussed uh, so far. George Nicolaitis is a psychiatrist, he, uh, but also with a research background in epidemiology. He's the scientific director of the Department of Mental Health and Social Welfare, Institute of Child Health, associated with the Greek Ministry of Health. And he is the former chairperson of Council of Europe's Lanzarote Committee for the Protection of Children from Sexual Exploitation and Sexual Abuse. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm glad to uh, be here, discuss all these uh, very important issues raised by uh, previous uh, speakers. Um, uh, just to put a historical context in the beginning of this uh, brief intervention, um, Daniel Dafoe, the writer of Robinson, who was born seven years after the Great Plague in London, uh, wrote also the Journal of the Great Plague, a famous book uh, 
who was depicting what happened in London by the time of the Great Plague. One interesting remark in that book was that by order of the Lord Mayor of London at that time, 200,000 cats and 60,000 dogs were slaughtered because they were considered as host carriers of the plague. Now, afterwards, nowadays, we know that the host of the plague is the rat. And by slaughtering all these stray dogs and cats, what the authorities of London actually did was accelerating the multiplication of the plague. Now, thinking of that, I cannot help thinking that uh, if three or four hundred years ago people would look back and see what human, the, the, what we did in the 21st century in addressing this COVID pandemic, then maybe they will have similar considerations of how foolish we behave in trying to maintain the threat. Now, uh, uh, so uh, I think that in dealing with the issue, we should distinguish at, at least three different levels of, of uh, considerations. One level is the underlying roots and causes of these new virus, viruses that seem to emerge throughout the last decades. And I'm sure that the modern way the agriculture is being structured, the market is being built and functioning, the exposure to globalization and exchanges, all these are relevant and the proposals or initiatives for promoting alternative models are very, very pertinent in finding a way of existing in the, the modern world uh, uh, with safety. However, I must remark that at this time, I think uh, that these kind of considerations cannot um, supply us with ammunitions in, in order to be able to present a viable political uh, perspective in how to deal with the pandemic right now. Because there are things from that perspective that can be done immediately, but of course, several changes in the structure of international commerce or that would take time. And that's, I'm afraid, uh, it's not what it's take, it is at stake uh, right now during these months. The second, I think, aspect which needs to be uh, considered is the pandemic in itself. We know now, we are not in February or March, we know that we are dealing with a pandemic with um, a, a case mortality rate that ranges for 0.15 to, let's say, the CDC latest quite inflamed uh, sort of uh, estimate, estimates, which are uh, 0.7 or 8 uh, percent. We know that we are uh, now in the middle of the 11th month of 2020, uh, that by now there are around 1,300,000 people registered as dying from COVID-19, despite the fact that in registration of deaths in the case of COVID-19, some things that were totally novel were introduced, such as uh, that 81 that was already having underlying severe medical conditions that could pass away with a positive test for COVID-19 should be registered as a a fatality by COVID-19, which is a quite novel thing. Consider that if we have used the same principle, nobody would have died from HIV. Everybody would have died out of toxoplasma and other uh, trivial infections. So that's uh, uh, 1,300,000 lives uh, have lost. Still, they probably would be less than the amount of fatalities we have globally in 2020 from tuberculosis, a disease in, for which an effective vaccination is available since decades. So that is just to put in the context that it is, of course, a severe case of a pandemic, but it's not something as in a science fiction film or novel. It's not definitely going to be the uh, disease, the pandemic of the of the century, because probably we're going to face more and more and probably more severe such pandemics in the 21st century. Now, there is a third level which I think requires more consideration, especially in the context in the context of the historical materialism uh, uh, event uh, today. 
and that is policy responses to the pandemic. And I think that we all need to uh, try to uh, contemplate on that uh, as detached from the pandemic itself, because several of the measures taken cannot be really made sense of in virtue of the epidemiological properties of the pandemic per se, but rather require a different type of explanation. Uh, for instance, we know that for the first time in the modern world, there have been a widespread restrictions of uh, social liberties imposed in the uh, form of lockdown measures, curfews and other uh, shelter in place orders that have been uh, issued in many countries. We know that some of them has have uh, made several participatory institutions, even the parliaments, looked as if their functionality is probably diminished. Countries, societies have been governed by TV uh, speeches by the prime ministers without any kind of even parliamentary control. That is not to be underestimated as a minor issue in the whole uh, 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 era of the pandemic. We know that in some countries, software that was recommended by governments was downloaded by almost half of the population in a few hours. Software that could allow governments to exercise control in the movement of millions of people. In a sense, what happened in the pandemic in the policy level was that China exported her biopower model to Europe and the rest of the developed world, and the developed world bought it very easily. I think these developments are not that uh, insignificant. We already know that in fatalities from COVID-19, despite any kind of dispute about the number of deaths and the registration and all that, we know that there's a disproportional rate of fatalities for the lower socioeconomic classes. We know that from studies coming from UK, the US and other parts of the world. We know that people who are poor and deprived and have already marginalized rights suffer more from the probability of dying out of this disease, especially in the US. We know that before the pandemic, there was a good proportion of the society that was uninsured or quasi insured in a way that created millions of people with underlying medical conditions that were not appropriately treated already when the pandemic emerged. So naturally, these people were at very much uh, at risk of dying or uh, having a severe disease from COVID-19. But we also know that the measures themselves are disproportionately burdening the poor and the disadvantaged, the lower socioeconomic classes, those who are exploited ones. We know that it's very different to pass a shelter in place uh, a quarantine time if you are Governor Cuomo or if you are a poor worker having to travel by mass transportation and go to work every day and live in a basement in a poor deprived area. You have totally different perception of what the quarantine is and what restrictions place is placing in your life. We also know that the coming, the forthcoming crisis and regression that was caused mainly by the measures that several governments have um, taken to respond to the pandemic are going to hit harder the lower socioeconomic class, classes. And we know that these measures did not only made social and economic harm to these lower exploited uh, parts of the societies, but we also know that they have placed an additional health burden on these uh, classes, because we already have studies and uh, compelling evidence that in most of the developed world, but also the developing world uh, countries, there would be losses of life by millions in virtue of the measures and not the pandemic. In the developing world, we know that the most deprived children will suffer from starvation and some of them will die just because schools and educations closed and they are depending on schools for the school meals in order to survive. UNICEF has released a report which is quite uh, shedding light on this very uh, interesting issue on that. We also know that in the developed world, several of the major killers of the societies which affect disproportionately, again, the lower socioeconomic classes like coronary disease or strokes or cancer 
have been cancelled because all the health systems have been reoriented towards addressing COVID-19 pandemic. We also know that the economic regression will also have an additional health burden and will put excess mortality, especially to the lower parts of the societies in terms of socioeconomic status, exactly by the same major killers, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, metabolic syndrome, and also mental health conditions. Now, this is not, again, something which should be left outside uh, the discussion for the policy response on behalf of the working class and the people uh, of this current uh, pandemic. Um, it's also, um, uh, okay, I'm, I'm just one minute and then I, I conclude. It's also, I think, a good time to contemplate about uh, the role of certain, certain scientific associations or organizations at national and international level. We know that there's WHO has made a very significant change in the neutrality of politics, especially since the, since the HIV era, which was accelerated by the neoliberal governance of uh, Dr. Chan as the general director, and now is continued by the current uh, director general. The same equally applies for national uh, centers, which I think we should develop critique uh, we, about how willing they are to serve the, indus the industry's interests and also the plans of government. Um, I have uh, signed the, myself the Great Barrington Declaration, which calls uh, societies and, uh, and countries to return to normality and uplift the lockdown uh, measures uh, and also translate it to Greek. Um, I'm not, of course, agreeing with everything everyone uh, says uh, in, in that initiative, but I think that this is a very crucial point, which found the left in the developed world uh, not uh, appropriately prepared to deal with that, such issue. Uh, the neoliberal right has invested in politics of fear throughout the last 30 years. I remember George W. Bush Renaming, renaming, relabeling hunger in a FAO uh, summit as a food security issue. Everything is a threat and security is to be prepared and given by the state to the societies in order to prevent them from potential threats. To that, the left has been rather unprepared and to some extent it has been a follower of what we call in European politics the extreme center, like President Macron or Spanish socialists, or sometimes was even more than the right uh, proposing uh, lockdown restrictions, which we know that they will make the lowest parts of the society suffer uh, even more. I think there are many other initiatives that now come to realize that this is Unreal, any other solution for now is unrealistic, is ineffective, and it, it is going to increase social inequality and take the class struggle uh, uh, backwards instead of forwards. And therefore, I think we need uh, initiatives to coordinate any kind of uh, uh, approach that uh, sees another alternative way forward. Thank you. Thanks a lot, George. Uh, we have already some questions, but first I will give the floor to Josep, who didn't manage to end his uh, uh, presentation for technical reasons. These things happen with, uh, when we're trying to coordinate something on at least two continents uh, and an island, Britain. Uh, so, Josep, you have the floor to conclude okay. your presentation. Yeah, I don't really remember. And we apologize to the audience for this uh, yeah. inconvenience, exactly. and then we, I will give the, the questions that we have so far. Okay. Okay, so apologize for this technical problem. I don't really remember when I finished, when everything disconnected. I think I was talking about the question of attention capitalism, and even I quote Reed Hastings from Netflix that he says that Netflix does not compete with HBO, YouTube, or whatever, but competes with sleep, and that Netflix is winning this, this race. I think that the question of attention capitalism is a kind of strategic uh, element for, for, for the left to discuss 
as important as the question of digital surveillance. But I think that digitalization has the two aspects, surveillance and attention capitalism. So I think that both are important. I think that I was talking on this when everything disconnected, but I, I don't really remember exactly the moment. Then there is an eighth question that I think that it's important to talk when it comes about political strategic challenges of today, which is I think that the lockdown uh, shown a very specific urban problems and a kind of a specific urban bias of, of our societies. In particular, it show this kind of illusory idea that we live outside of the natural world. And I think that that was uh, very, very clear. And uh, I think that this is one of the questions that 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 have to be discussed more in the sense that to link the, the all the urban debates of the right to the city and so on with environmental problems and the environmentalist discussion. There is a journalist, Richard Love, that has a book called Last Child in the Boots, who says even he talks about the nature deficit disorder to talk about the educational problems of, of uh, people, in particular child, that are grown with no contact at all with nature and wilderness and uh, just locking in hard sense urban world. I think that this question of right to the city linked with the environmental questions is also an important problem that the, lo the lockdown show. And finally, my ninth question, just, just to finish, I think is that it's clear that the pandemics and the lockdown and so on has also changed the, the meaning of fear, which is a very important element in our society and has changed the global geography of fear in the sense that in the Western world, there was the kind of illusion somehow that, that to be a site of the more hottest place in, in the world when it comes to health or uh, danger problems. And I think that pandemics has brought uh, uh, at the core of Western societies and at the core of its middle class, this new sense of fear. And I think that somehow that, may, that also uh, sheds new light on the debate of ordinary and extraordinary things, in the sense that many of the extraordinary things during, uh, during the lockdown, in fact, are very ordinary for many people in the world. And many of the extraordinary things that we experience during the lockdown and during this crisis are very ordinary for many people in other parts of the world. And just to finish, I think that the classic idea of Benjamin, that, that the tradition of the oppressed teaches us that the emergency situation is in which we live is the rule, can be useful to understand this, of course, if we understand this, not in the sense, not to distinguish between crisis and normal moments, and also not in the sense to dissolve the very idea of, of crisis into a pathological normality. But I think that if we understand, but we can understand this Benjamin sentence in, in the sense to remember the harshness of daily life for millions of people under global capitalism. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Josep. Now, we have the first series of questions, uh, as far as I can see from the chat. Okay, there is, first of all, a series of questions for Rob uh, from Terry Dunn. Uh, how far are we to locating the specific origins of COVID-19? You put from up a part of Wuhan. Is the, this is the first part of the question, is the expansion of agricultural land, their palm oil plantations or some other landscape favorable to bats? So it's a continuation of the, are there new production lines associated with this expansion into the, into the forest? Was this environment perhaps less conducive to earlier crops? Uh, and on the agroecology interventions, what is the political background to the Belo Horizonte initiatives? In Europe, a lot of organic production is just a sort of a luxury niche. So this is the question for Rob, uh, basically. And then we have a question for the entire panel, which if someone, ex if could someone explain why are Africa's coronavirus successes being overlooked? This is a question from uh, Irina, uh, uh, Irina Castro. So I would suggest, okay, Rob, you have sure. to answer, uh, yeah. and then whoever wants to answer the Africa question, or if also both you, uh, Rob, and, and <coughs> whoever else. And uh, yes, and I have a question now uh, for Richard. I will post it afterwards and then we will go on. Okay, Rob, you have the floor. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's fascinating. We're 11 months out from the uh, 
uh, at least the, uh, when the world realized we were in the middle or the beginning of a pandemic. And uh, um, is what's fascinating about it is that we have both uh, arrived at uh, a sense of conclusive understanding that uh, of the origins that uh, of some sort of spillover event. And uh, at the same time, uh, have little understanding of any of the details of it, but we're comfortable with not knowing that um, because we're in the middle of the emergency and it was brought up this contrast between structural emergency that the, uh, but the problem with just focusing on emergency is that uh, it undercuts the exploration of the structural causes. I mean, it's, it's used as a way of uh, sucking the air out of the room so that we don't talk about uh, those structural aspects. The other thing, of course, is that the structural is foundationally integrated with the emergency. You can't succeed engaging in uh, emergency uh, measures if you haven't also uh, addressed in the structural in real time. They're not on different, necessarily on different uh, temporal planes. Um, so on the one hand, we have some sense of being comfortable with the notion of not knowing uh, this. We have a an emergent... Um, understanding among establishment scientists that there was a spillover event and uh, and it's often presented as in contrast to the <clears throat> hokey uh, lab origins that Richard uh, brought up. Um, but on the other hand, uh, they're not all hokey. That's the problem. Uh, the fact of the matter, I mean, clearly the notion of uh, military games in the U.S. and Wuhan and all that is all crap. Clearly, uh, the, the Trump administration uh, uh, attempt to blame China on this in the sense of uh, spillover from a lab as an attempt to wash his hands of responsibility for failing to protect his own country. Um, but they are, um, it's not a done deal. I mean, there are circulating uh, hypotheses concerning um, um, possible spillover events out of, uh, in, among cave miners in Yunnan, uh, samples of which were taken to, back to Wuhan. And uh, it's a Princeton University study, 2013, that um, plots out the number of new BSL-3 and 4 labs that were uh, built since 9-11 and H5N1, the first celebrity virus um, of the century. And they number in the thousands, uh, spanning out into uh, greater uh, into Asia and including the Wuhan lab. Uh, so the possibility of a very rare event like a lab accident uh, bends towards inevitability the more op opportunities that you give to, to doing that. So what I'm getting at here is I'm very much a proponent of the field hypothesis. I do think cutting into the forest, uh, whether for Ebola in Africa or, or uh, the coronaviruses in, the, um, in China, um, driven by um, you know, bricks or neoliberal versions of uh, development uh, did increase the interface between reservoirs of bats and spilling over. And I think a lot of the uh, the new uh, phylogenetics works indicates that it really doesn't have to do with Wuhan, that uh, in all likelihood the spillover event occurred perhaps even years earlier. And that um, this one, COVID-19, the SARS-2 was circulating among uh, humans for many years, picking up uh, uh, increasing its uh, contact and or ability to infiltrate the human immune system before it finally um, uh, bursts free in Wuhan. So, to, in other words, um, we're not quite clear about that. And uh, while the beginning year I was so sure, and the more I know, the less I'm quite sh uh, any of us really should be sure of that. And it's going to take considerable more work, except the establishment scientists have locked it in as a pillar of the um, political economy because um, not knowing the origins opens up the discussion of the structural that they're trying to, to close off. In, uh, and yes, indeed, many uh, a scientists, not consciously or not, I don't think they're envelopes that are, are you know, put underneath the table, but there's, there's grant money and filtering processes at the level of hiring and, um, and such that um, selects for... Uh, particular um, paradigms and positions that uh, protect um, the, the present uh, um, constellation of uh, neoliberal and, and biopolitical uh, uh, states. So um, that's where we are with that. We don't have an answer on that. As far as the expansion of agricultural land, uh, as for palm oil plantations, I think you might be referring to those in Africa. I don't know much palm oil in China.
but clearly that um, our group, uh, we have a, we call it the neoliberal Ebola, um, the one that emerged in uh, West Africa 2013, um, excuse me, uh, yeah, 2013 on. And, um, you know, um, the Ebola that emerged then genetically was not that dissimilar from those that em have emerged since uh, the mid 70s. Um, same clinical course, same epidemiological parameters. So how do you go from knocking down a couple villages to, in essence, uh, infecting 35,000 people, killing 11,000 people, leaving bodies in the, the streets of regional capitals? And that has more to do uh, with causality not being necessarily in the object of the virus, but out in the field of social relationships. And in this case, our uh, hypothesis is that uh, West Africa had been subjected to structural adjustment programs and uh, infiltration by uh, multinationals. Uh, I mean, that was in Liberia since uh, 1925, but uh, other countries nearby, uh, Guinea and Sierra Leone, had, had an uptick in that. And uh, local agroforestry was, in essence, replaced. You know, it's a whole land enclosure thing uh, that uh, marked the beginning of uh, modern capitalism in Britain, but uh, now it was taking place in West Africa. So uh, bats that were reservoirs for um, uh, Ebola uh, were suddenly able to uh, more have a great interface uh, with humans on these uh, palm oil plantations. Uh, I need to wrap up here, but um, um, we'll just leave it at that for now. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm sorry for this uh, interruption to wrap up, but we are slightly running out of time. We had the question on what, on the situation in Africa. Anyone who wants to comment on that? George? Yes. Uh, if you see the mortality patterns from the various influenza or parainfluenza, it's not one virus, it's a variety of virus in the previous 20 years in Africa, you would see that there's an uh, somehow equivalent pattern. The countries mostly hit is what were and uh, currently is the same in COVID-19 pandemic is South Africa and the countries of the uh, north of Africa in the Mediterranean. While the sub-Saharan Africa uh, countries usually do not have a, a excessive uh, mortality from seasonal influenza or in general infections of the respiratory system. Now, why is that happening? There are a lot of explanations, one of which is, of course, that the societies with younger populations and these uh, types of diseases usually have increased lethality in uh, populations of uh, the elderly. Uh, a second is that, unfortunately, there are other major killers that might uh, kill the susceptible population and therefore those kinds of respiratory infections have not that kind of fuel to, to burn. Uh, so uh, it's not the same as in previous years, but it's the same pattern, the, the same increases and the, 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 sa the same decreases. So I think that might be uh, from an explanatory uh, perspective useful. Thank you. Okay, now we have a question for for Richard, uh, and uh, actually the question is, do you see disaster nationalism response shifting from business as usual to more of we are handling it as best as we can while not doing much as Trump was doing? That was a question from uh, Mariam Mustak, uh, which uh, uh, also elaborated it as, would you categorize the response as no response in the sense of biopolitics making live and letting die, power ignoring death, death denial? Okay, all right. Well, I mean, first thing, I think it's very clear that Trump, uh, right to the very end, um, has been clinging to the story that, uh, you know, they're, they're going to restore business as usual as quickly as possible. What was the phrase he kept using on the uh, stump? We are rounding the turn, he kept saying. We are rounding the turn. Against all evidence, obviously. Um, I mean, obviously, they, it, it was just catastrophic, uh, his actual policy. Um, but um, I think that uh, it's important um, to see what this is actually about, um, 
in part, there is the sort of, um, the, as I mentioned, the kind of passion for this sort of social Darwinist process, the belief that essentially uh, we should uh, live and let die. Um, but I think also, I mean, I mentioned in passing the idea of uh, Trump contributing to his own contagion in the form of conspiracist paranoia. Um, I think it's we should actually take that seriously. One of the things that behavioral psychologists and ep epidemiologists um, understand in a way is that social space is an epidemiological space. This is absolutely uncontroversial now. Um, whereas we used to talk about, uh, you know, crowd pathologies, contagions and so on, we now talk about diffusion. Um, and it seems to me that um, uh, if we take the theory seriously, um, these, um, the, the sort of theories that uh, Donald Trump has been propagating um, the various and often contradictory theories, almost uh, broken kettle responses um, to the coronavirus. You know, it's either it's uh, it's not a big deal, or it's liberals over talking it, or it's uh, China, etc., etc., etc. It seems to me that these uh, have to be seen as what you might call what Damon Santola in his work on diffusion would call complex contagions. That is, they have a fairly high threshold for uptake. Um, and that means that, uh, you know, this isn't just Trump, right? This can't be just Trump push, putting something out there like it's not like a, a virus, a simple contagion that spreads uh, with relatively few barriers, particularly through weak ties, for example. This spreads because the social thresholds for the spread of this kind of line has already been reached. And therefore, the problem is not Trump, right? Um, the problem is that there is a widespread social desire in society for this kind of response. I say widespread, I don't mean to imply majority, but Trump increased his vote by about 9 million votes between 2016 and 2020. So um, I don't think this is just about uh, what Trump was doing. Uh, I just want to um, uh, finish. I'm, I, I, I'm going to leave the other part uh, more or less unanswered, but I just want to finish with a, a brief comment on uh, the case in um, Africa. Of course, you know, one of the problems is totalizing. Uh, Africa is not a, a single nation state. It's a very diverse. And I, I think the last speaker pointed that out. But one thing that seems pretty obvious to me is that it, there's a pretty strong correlation across the world. I'm sure someone else will uh, complicate this or point out why I'm wrong, but it seems there's a very strong correlation between the rate of um, capitalist growth and development and the rate of the spread of coronavirus. It seems that quite clearly in the Middle East, the um, rate of uh, dis uh, dis uh, dissemination of the virus is much lower than in Europe. Um, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, it's much lower than in Europe uh, or, in, or in North America. Um, clearly, uh, given that we've been saying that, uh, you know, the capitalist mode of production and its um, you know, development of high-speed transit, uh, high-speed trade, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is very heavily implicated in this, um, it's quite probable that that's a big part of the answer. Of course, I'm aware that there are other policy successes too in various African countries that we ought to learn from. Thanks a lot, Richard. Well, uh, okay, let's see what other questions we have. We have another one for Richard, but before that, I would like also to pose a question to Josep. Uh, and my question will be based on your presentation and using another notion that you have used in the past uh, on the need for a strategic imagination from the part uh, of the left. I mean, what's your take? Have you seen the kind of uh, strategic imagination one would uh, expect from the left in this conjecture of a crisis exactly in the complex and, and really fascinating way that you described the, this conjecture today? So that's the question for Josep. And then Richard, uh, yes, I will have another question for you from, from the audience. Okay, so about the left today, I don't know, I have a kind of mixed feelings, no? because on the one hand, there's been a lot of intellectual production and a lot of debates and a lot of uh, things. And even, for example, the fact that most of the left who comes from social science background have few understanding of natural science and so on, everybody has been forced to begin to think about questions that many social scientists 
are not very much aware like environmental issues, epidemiologies and so on. So I think that there is a kind of fertile cross cross mixing intellectual debate. So I think that there are very interesting things. But also, I don't know, I think that the, the problem is that the global situation is difficult for the left. It's clear that I am talking from a country uh, in Catalonia and in the Spanish state where there is a global paralysis. And for example, it's very difficult even to mobilize. If you compare with the United States that the pandemics happen with Black Lives Matter, it's a very different situation. Huh? For example, here there is even very difficult concrete uh, way to do a small demonstration or whatever because of uh, restrictions, fear and so on. So it's a global paralysis in terms of practical activities in the streets. Huh? So maybe depending on the place you, you live, you have a different idea of, of the level of dynamism or, or not dynamism that movements and the left is, is having in the case of the Spanish state is a moment of stagnation and you know a, a kind of disorientation and so on. But it seems to me that the, maybe the most interesting thing is that the new the new strength that debates on social reproduction and and how to link uh, you know uh, have a better feminist uh, reading of the world. Also the question of the importance of manual workers logistics and so on. So I think that there are new debates that are important, that somehow allow to have a better understanding of the world and, and, than, than we had some um, few months ago. The problem for me is how we can translate this in a more practical, collective uh, project. I think that as analysis, as new windows to see the world, I think that everybody's seeing the world with better windows than six months ago and we have better understanding of underlying problems and, and mixing uh, and making more linkages between things that used to be apart and so on. The problem for me is that there is a certain paralysis, at least in many countries, about political initiatives and, 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 and how to move forward. That's, I think, that's, that's the biggest problem I find. Okay, so uh, since okay, we have another question for Richard, and I would suggest so that we so, uh, so we we'll keep track on time. Richard, you answer that uh, question, which is for you. I will read it in a minute, in a, in a second, uh, and say, and then the the rest of you, if you want to add something small, two minutes, you know, just just a phrase so that we can wrap up in time and also give us some time to prepare for the next uh, politics of the pandemic panel. Okay, so Richard, the question for you, which is from Philip Mesco, is what, the, what does your uh, hypothesis of far-right death drive entail for the fight against them? And two, how does it map onto the case of Sweden's pandemic response? This is the question. So Richard, you have the floor and then we go to the others for some closing remarks, okay? Well, I'm going to bracket uh, the uh, specific part about death drive just for a minute, because that introduces some complexities. But um, certainly the basic idea that the far right um, is not um, driven by um, the offer of material improvement, um, I think is rather important. Um, there's a pretty, um, I mean, this is a commonplace about the Third Reich, but uh, Richard Grunberg and his social history of the Third Reich put this um, very pithily when he said that the uh, psychological um, improvement outpaced any material advantage. Um, and that is the uh, most extraordinary thing about, uh, you know, if you look at uh, Trump supporters, if you look at Modi supporters, if you look where uh, this form of nationalism is thriving, um, first of all, it it finds its recruits. Um, I mean, there's some there's some evidence for this. I have to say, I'm speculating to somewhat to an extent here, but uh, there seems to be some evidence that it finds its recruits among the psychologically depressed. Okay, um, and you know there is there are very, much higher rates of depression today socially than there have been for a long time, um, and that this form of politics offers some sort of uh, response. Um, in other words. If you're fighting with your demons, well, here's some real demons for you to fight with. Um, and uh, it's um, it, it's also quite important to say that it's, um, you know, the left sometimes misses this. Meaning is a material interest just as much as, um, for example, uh, your, your pay packet. And we, you know, often wonder why do people vote against uh, 
uh, measures that are good, not just for their, um, you know, like their, their incomes and so on, but measures actually are very bad for their incomes that actually bode ill for them. And sometimes, of course, as we've seen with uh, the United States and Trump, um, you know, that are bad for their health, bad for their future well-being. This is where, of course, the death drive comes in, because the death drive obviously has no regard to the organ organism's well-being. It just spins on and on and on. How does this map on to the case of Sweden's pandemic response? Um, I don't think it really does um, in any straightforward sense. Uh, I think Sweden's response um, was um, mistaken, um, was based on uh, some quite um, complacent assumptions. Um, it doesn't seem to have done much better uh, either in economically or in terms of managing the coronavirus than its immediate uh, European neighbours um, who, who are comparable in that respect. Of course, you know, there's there's arguments over exactly what that means, but we now see that uh, cases are rising uh, pretty fast in Sweden. Um, but I don't think this was driven so much by coronavirus, uh, sorry, death drive, as it was by a version of the capitalist biopolitics uh, through which um, the British government and various other governments tried to uh, manage this plague. Um, I think that um, if you look at how the British government tried to get out of the plague by instituting a sort of depoliticized regional system of various lock varying lockdowns, um, aggressive reopening on some fronts with uh, more controls on population movement and more surveillance, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, it's in the same broad um, sort of scheme of things. Um, so that should really cause us to question uh, the underlying predicates of this form of capitalist biopolitics, because although clearly um, there, there isn't a, a sort of ready-to-hand sort of communist alternative that we can just implement, uh, we nonetheless uh, are direly in need of that critical perspective. I'll leave it there. Thanks a lot now for uh, concluding remarks. Rob? Yeah, sure. Uh, I have to say that, you know, uh, certainly our, our, our manual here really was able to uh, unpack a few things. I, I appreciate the taxonomy of, of rightist responses. I appreciate the notion of crisis as a, a more than merely a problem, a, a potential uh, turning point. Um, but I think uh, we're in some ways wrapped up in a, a you know, a kind of a circular yeah, firing squad, but we're really uh, insular uh, in that uh, much of the world is coming up with solutions to some of the things that we've been discussing. I mean, you know, why, you know, uh, not only what's going on in Africa, but I gave the solution here in the U.S. of uh, uh, farmers uh, buying up abattoirs for themselves. Um, you know, um, you know, there's some interventions that we can do, but uh, I think more it's about uh, reorienting our, our notions of uh, what... Um, uh, scholarships and, and uh, scholarship and political uh, commentary can, can do. I mean, uh, I've uh, found myself in the last couple of years uh, unplugging out of um, universities and and moving toward more of a science for the people and um, working with farmers and uh, uh, you know peasants and indigenous uh, coming up with solutions. And it's and I'm not shitting on us here. I mean, I'm, you know, uh, we're, we're coming up with some good stuff here. But I mean, it's really a uh, uh, you know, I think we're so uh, in, in, hammered, and I'm, I'll finish up here, we're so hammered by uh, what the, the right and the, and the extreme center can do on, on a dime. They can, do, they can implement the most stupid uh, uh, paradigm possible on uh, the snap of a finger, and it's uh, somewhat demoralizing. But we got to move toward uh, working with people, everyday people who are, are doing what they need to do to, to get out from underneath this. We need to look at Via Campesina, we need to look at indigenous groups, we need to look at the global south. We need to start working uh, with people around the world who are already been coming up with solutions over the last 500 years. Uh, they know an apocalypse they, when they see it, and they've been surviving since then. And um, I'll stop. And to end, Belo Horizonte isn't just European kind of organic consumerism. I mean, that example of them working out there uh, municipal food program was bottom up out of the uh, Workers Party fighting against the dictatorship for decades. And they built this thing bottom up uh, with people in the uh, municipal government and local farmers. So we don't do that in the US and Europe. Maybe we should start talking to people who do. Okay, thanks a lot, Josep. Uh, concluding remarks, keep it short.
okay, okay, just uh, I don't really have many specific things maybe to say to conclude that have not been said, but there is one issue that probably was not very much in the panel that I think it's also interesting to discuss, and maybe I would like just to make a, a brief comment on this, is also how all this pandemic and so on also puts on the table the debate of the link between politics and science, which I think it's also uh, a very important thing to discuss. And I think that on this we have a kind of very different um, trends that, that coexist in the world, because on the one hand we have the far right uh, anti-rational, anti-scientific point of view, you, uh, and on the other hand we have the tendency of mainstream governments to depoliticize decisions under the name of science, which is the classic technocratic tyranny of expertise. And I think it's complicated to move in between, yeah, because on, on the one hand, we have to stress the relevance of science, scientific knowledge, and so on against the far right irrationalism. But on the other hand, we need to fight the question of expertise, depoliticization of politics, which is what, uh, what, what mainstream governments in Europe are doing. And I think that's, that's also a complicated question to balance that also has to, to, to be put on the floor and has to be considered when, when talking about political strategy and, and political debate. So maybe it's just the last thing that I, I, I would like to add in the panel. Okay, thanks a lot, Josep. George, any final uh, words, comments? Yes, thank you. Just two comments. Uh, one, uh, I think we should be uh, careful when uh, referring to factual uh, elements. Uh, yes, indeed, one of the first immortality countries in the world from COVID-19 is Belgium, but the second is Peru. And in the first decade, we have 10, 10 countries. We have US, uh, UK, but also we have Mexico, uh, Chile, Argentina, Ecuador. So I think that uh, to say that it's those countries which are developed or uh, developing, it's it's uh, a little bit uh, unfair to, to the factual situation. The same equally applies about Sweden. Sweden is falling in the world's uh, ranking uh, since uh, early summer. And it's also falling in the overall excess mortality for 2020. So, uh, on the contrary, other countries with very strict <laughs> extreme lockdown measures like France are climbing up. So I think we should be more careful in data, which are uh, temporal in nature, because now you get a snapshot, but maybe in the summer you would have a totally different uh, image. My second point, if I have uh, half a minute, because I'm a psychiatrist by trade, I, I was tempted by the reference to the death drive. Um, uh, I tend to explain the current situation, not, I, I think not in the same way, uh, I found very helpful the works of Wilfred Bion, the British psychoanalyst, who made very beautiful remarks during the First World War. And I think it's a pre regression that is caused to the population. Look at what they say to every one of us. You're, the other person is a lethal threat to you. You also are a lethal instrument to other people. I think this sort of concepts that are being omitted from everywhere in societies nowadays are going to do uh, the landscape more hard for any kind of left initiative because the left is, of course, on the side of collective uh, uh, effort and collective effort if the other is a lethal threat and you are also a lethal threat to others, it's, it's made more difficult. Uh, to that sense, I believe that the ultimate uh, form of denial that we face in the current situation is the one by the dominant rhetoric continuously say that they have a magic way of avoiding all fatalities and avoiding the to pass through society. Instead, they, they should acknowledge that this is something that will happen and societies should invest in strengthening their resilience and, uh, and supporting the more vulnerable. Uh, the slogan of avoiding all and every deaths has always a tacit agenda. Anyway, thanks, thanks a lot, everybody. It was a really interesting panel, and in about uh, 38 minutes, we'll have another panel, the politics of the pandemic, too. So, so please also uh, attend that. And just a reminder.
Historical Medieval Online continues. Tomorrow we have more panels. And please do remember to support the Historical Materialism Project by subscribing to the journal, getting your institutions to get the books in the Brill series, and take advantage of the 50% discount offered in all the books in the book series from, uh, from Haymarket. And yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot to everybody. Uh, good, good afternoon and good evening and good night, depending on the time zone. Thanks. Subscribe to Historical Materialism Journal, buy books in the Historical Materialism book series, and get back to work.